Hi, everyone. Today is our first kind of hybrid event. So if you're joining us um, online or in person, thank you everyone for coming. Um, we have a very exciting workshop planned today. Um, today we have James T from Microsoft who's coming in to talk a little bit about generative AI and its role in kind of design process. So um, definitely an exciting design trend to talk about. Um, it's something that I'm very interested in. So um, yeah, with that, I'll just pass it off to James if you want to get started and introduce yourself. Sure. Um, just quickly show of hands how many people were at the talk last night. Okay, so... All right, so we have some folks that are missing, uh, haven't seen the full thing. Okay, I'm going to go through uh, last night's presentation fairly quickly. Um, so um, the idea is to get to Q&A fairly fast. Um, like last night, I ended up talking way longer than I thought I would, um, and we ran out of Q&A time. So, um, so if I'm going too fast and there's something that you missed, just hold off until we get to questions. Cool. All right. Um, my name is James. I am a design manager over at Microsoft and I am in the Azure AI platform. And so we design tools and services for developers so that they can access and um, integrate AI into anything that they are building. So, you know, we don't necessarily make the snowboard. We make the snowboard faster, smarter, better. Right. So, um, all right. Okay, let me get here. So I start off with the definition of uh, artificial intelligence. And this is basically, it's a math problem that can act like a human. And it can do that because it's based off of uh, what it's learned. And it learns that based off of data. And so there are some kind of, a lot of terms that get thrown around like machine learning and deep learning and AI, they're all relatively uh, related to one another. They're all kind of subsets of one another. You have AI, that's the, that's the math problem. That's the thing that does the work. In there, you have machine learning. Machine learning is about the data component. And then you have deep learning. Deep learning is actually the algorithm, right? Um, and how it learns. So the process that we have for this, um, I'll click from here, is you start with collecting your data. And there's a lot of work that goes into collecting data. The main thing here is that you're collecting data that you can use, right? Um, and part of that is understanding, is it actually data you own? Or um, did you collect it ethically? Um, is it actually in a format that you can use? If not, you spend a lot of time cleaning that data, right? You get it in a way, uh, a structure, a format that the model can actually start to ingest, right? Once you clean the data and you organize it, you make it uh, digestible, you actually start to train the model. So now you are feeding the data to the model and the model is learning based off of the data that you feed it. Then you test it. Are you able now to do what we design you to do based off of the information that we provided to you? And if not, you retrain. You might augment your data. You might do something to the data to make it more relevant. Or you might train, actually augment the actual algorithm itself. But you do that many, many cycles until the model is actually able to complete the tasks that you assigned it to a high level of proficiency and quality. You're able now to deploy that model. But at this point that you deploy the model, ChatGPT is out in the world, right? That doesn't mean you're done that model is actually now still collecting data. And you repeat this whole cycle again. That is AI. The machine learning part is the data to the testing. Um, deep learning is actually the neural networks that work of training and learning, the math problem, right? 
Okay, so that's a core concept. The key takeaway is you don't have AI without data, it's oxygen. So if you guys are all gonna go out and explore the universe of AI and stuff like that in your fancy spaceman suit, you can't do that without data and oxygen, right? You will die, your, your algorithms will not work. So know that at the end of the day, your job as a designer is completely tied to understanding the data if you are in the AI world. Okay, so when now we have these big things called language, large language models. And essentially, these are algorithms that have been trained on the internet. So GPT-4 from OpenAI was trained on 175 billion parameters, right? Think about it. that's 175 billion little bits of information to get it to do all the amazing things that it can do right now. So here's a piece of content that I copied from one of Microsoft's websites. And I asked it, I could ask a couple models to summarize this information, right? I'm sorry, I don't know how to get rid of this stuff here. So um, maybe if I click here, no. Maybe click on more. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, whatever. Sorry, guys. Um, so on the left, you see bulleted information. On the right, you see another summarization of this. The one on the left used a model that was trained on 700 million parameters, much smaller. But the way that it was trained is, it was trained only learn how to summarize. That's all it does. You feed a text, you specify how many words you want back, and it gives you exactly that. That's all it does. You ask it who won you know, the Super Bowl, it won't know stuff like that, right? It was never trained to do anything except for summarization. The model, the, the information on the right was using ChatGPT. I just gave it the article and said, summarize this. And it spit out this summary. The difference between the two is the one on the left, all the words that you see there were summarized from the document I fed it. Those are words that actually showed up in the document. The summary on the right, the, the model actually wrote that. Those words may or may not appear in the actual article because what the model on the right does it doesn't actually know what the article is about that model recognized patterns and put together a string of words based off of the probability of the next word in the sequence based off of the sample sample data that you fed it it sounds coherent because it actually learned how to speak. But the content is inferred. Right? It isn't the actual content from the document. It's inferred from the data and says, we think to a high level of probability that here's a sequence of words that describe the data that you fed me. It may or may not actually be true. Right? The difference between these two things, gosh darn it, control. is deterministic versus indeterministic. These are two terms that you really need to understand in AI. Deterministic means that it literally is based off of the information you fed me. Indeterministic means it's an approximation of the information you fed me. And it's important to know what capability the model that you're using in your AI solution is, is using, right? Because if you go with a deterministic model, you may not have all the capabilities of a larger, smarter model. 
it will only do the one thing really well, right? But if you want more of that general knowledge, it comes at the price of it might make some stuff up, right? So what's new with LLMs? Okay, so you got these big LLMs. They're incredibly powerful. They know the internet, right? General knowledge. You want, you ask it, it's like Wikipedia on steroids, right? Really great at Q&A, really great at um, uh, that type of generation. But it is probabilistic and it is indeterminate, which means that it can be a little bit unpredictable. It's unrepeatable. You can ask it the same question 10 times, you probably will get six different answers, right? Um, it's also uncensored. So unless you tell it, don't answer like a jerk, it might answer like a jerk, right? And it's also bias. So think about uh, search engine uh, optimization. People have paid for their data to show up more than other data, even if the other data is more true than their data, right? Guess what the model was trained on? It was trained on the most data. It's inherently biased, right? So what we do as the designers, as designers of applications with AI is that we're trying to figure out tools and services that help you constrain the power of these LLMs, and we constrain what they know and how they act, right? So that they can be um, more targeted, more predictable, more repeatable, more reliable, and safe. Right? Okay, so how do we do that? There are three big concepts that I want you to understand. You can constrain a model by fine tuning, by designing the prompts, what you're telling it, the instructions, and by grounding it to a specific data set. That question? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, so, all right. Um, so let's start with fine tuning. Fine tuning is actually like a mini process of taking a new set of data and retraining the model with machine learning. I collected new data, I cleaned it, I retrain it, I retest it, and now my model knows how to, this new piece of information, right? The upside is now you know that information, you can act on it. The downside though, is you might've over indexed the model on that new information. So it's, it might over fit on the new information at the expense of the general knowledge. The other thing is it's expensive to do that, right? Think of having to the cost of training a model on a billion, 175 billion parameters. It took four or five years for OpenAI to, to do that, right? Doing it 24 seven, that was exceedingly expensive. You're doing a mini version of that plus fine tuning, that gets really expensive, right? And you're not necessarily guaranteed that you're going to get the outcome that you want because it's still indeterminate and it's still, you know, probabilistic. So there's a questionable return on investment by retraining. And so it's really used for specific instances. The other idea is designing the prompt, right? I'm going to be very specific in the instructions that I give this model, and that's the way I'm going to control how it acts. So this is all about modifying the behavior, not what it knows, but how it acts on what it knows. And the key thing here is what you type in, the instructions that you type in are only the tip of the iceberg. Underneath that, the system is sending a system message or a, me a meta prompt with a whole host of other instructions. So when the first models from OpenAI released and you asked it a question, it didn't remember state, meaning like you could ask a related question as a follow-up to the answer it provided you. It didn't understand, it didn't remember the answer it just gave you because it was never trained to do that. So did they fine tune and retrain it? No, what they're doing is 
they have created a system prompt that takes the answer from the previous one with the previous question and they make it next, the part of the next prompt. They embed it into the next prompt and say, answer your answer the new question based off of how you answered the old question. And it keeps on doing that in succession. And that's how it remembers state and context is because it's just filtering and adding that same, the all the questions in line so they can answer correctly. But did you guys see that? No, that's all happening under, under the surface, right? You're just asking your question. It's all getting added and it's getting sent back to the model. So that's prompt design. And there's an emerging field around that. When you look at system messages and meta prompts, it looks like code. It doesn't look like English. There's English sprinkled in there. And then there was a bunch of characters and parentheses and all this other stuff. It looks just like gobbledygook to me. But um, um, that, it, there's a lot of work happening there. Okay. All right. The other concept that you need to get understand, and this is really important because this is what's happening most now, right, is grounding data. So this is also called, and it's under the UI there, it's called retrieval augmented generation. And what this is, is you take a new piece of data, a set of data, and you inject it into a current model. You say, here's a new piece of information. Anything that you do from here on out, do only on top of this information and what you know about this information, right? So models, LLMs are actually time stamped, meaning that they don't know anything from the point that it was released. So GPT-4, I think was finished training at the end of 2022 or the beginning of 2023. It doesn't know anything that happened after that, but yet, you can go to GPT now, ask it questions, and it knows about stuff, recent stuff. How does that happen? They're doing rags, right? They're injecting new information into it constantly, right? So that it, that's the way that they can keep it up to speed. And this is happening everywhere, right? And so this is how you get ChatGPT to do something very specialized. You say, here's some special information. Now to go do your thing on top of this, right? Okay. All right, what can LLMs do? The main thing is they can do a, a whole bunch. And the message from last night was, we're still figuring it out. We don't know everything that this thing can do. Every day, it seems like we discover something new it can do, right? So this list is like, it's ongoing. In fact, I was joking last night. I created this list maybe three months ago. I think it's already out of date, quite honestly. I don't know. Um, this next slide kind of talks about how people are using these things and the industries that are really uh, uh, taking advantage of the technology. So media and entertainment, healthcare, education, business, obviously everybody's trying to figure out how to make money off of this thing. But it also is impacting us, art and design, in a big way. Look at what Adobe's done. Look at the image generators, right? Look at the copy generators. It's really impacting the stuff that we're done. So we're gonna talk about that impact in a little bit. All right, the other big takeaway is LLMs require a shit ton of power, right? These GPUs suck up power like it's candy. It is crazy amount of power. And that power consumption that compute uh, demand is actually a constraint. People can't afford to run them at scale. I can create a small proof of concept. It's great. 10 people are playing with it. I ask a billion people to use it. I can't afford a billion people to run. It's too expensive, right? So we've created this thing that's so powerful, but you can't afford to use it. That really is a big constraint to businesses actually being able to adopt this stuff. So we spend at Microsoft and what I do, I spend an enormous amount of time trying to figure out how to make this usable, right? 
that's my job is actually our group's job to do that. Um, so what's next? All right, assistive ubiquity. Everyone gets a co-pilot, right? That's Microsoft's point of view. We, we're putting co-pilot on everything. It's like salt, right? Um, but this is what you're gonna see. Everything that you're gonna do from here on out is gonna have a little assistant on the side. And that assistant is gonna start to take more and more of those mundane tasks and automate them, right? Or is gonna make it contextual. How many times have you been in an app where you want to figure out how to do something and you forgot where that menu item was? Oh God, I think it's over here. Uh, now we just ask ChatGP, hey, where is this? Or do this for me. And it brings up that UI, right? That is kind of the assistive world that we're gonna be in starting today, right? All right, multimodality. Multimodality means that the old models only worked off of text, text in, text out. Now you can use image, sound as an input. You can just send it a picture and say, ask a question on this picture and it will answer. It reads the picture. Listen to this, what is this? I don't know if you guys uh, have an Apple phone that says you're bird chirping, what bird is that? And it tells you, or uh, um, the app that tells you what this song is, right? Shazam. Shazam, thank you. Um, Shazam is actually using early generative, early models, AI models. It's now since been replaced with the generative model. So, so that's a lot better, but anyway, sorry. Um, but now you can use multimodality in and it actually now has the ability to do multimodal out. I can create pictures. I can create videos. I can make music. I can copy sounds. I can copy speech. That's multimodal. And so I'm going to play a quick video. Hopefully it works. If not, it's because it's on Zoom and it's not. Please or huh. it's not working. I'm sorry, folks. Online, I'm going to have to escape out of this. Um, let me try this. Are folks still seeing this screen? One, yeah. Um, I can't see. Okay. Well, I'm not going to be able to play that one today, I guess. Sorry about that. That was a scary one too. Hold on, let me try to find it another way. Um, no, I'm gonna have to try to figure that one out. But anyway, okay, so what that video showed, um, unfortunately that I don't have right now, is uh, basically a synthetic avatar. Um, and that synthetic avatar is literally based off of a real person. So what you see on the left is a vid sample video that was fed to a model. What you see on the right is the model replicating a, stand a, a live digital synthesized version of that person based off of reading the video and making a version of it. That's a digital facsimile. And what we can do with that now is we can link it to any voice font that we create digitally. We can synthesize your voice with a very little amount of listening to you. We can make a voice that sounds just like you. 
And we can tie it to an algorithm that mimics style, any style of speech. And then we can tie it to any language. So now we can make this digital avatar speak, move, just like you, and say whatever we want you to, to say. But the cool thing about this is, instead of somebody typing something and it reading a script, we tied it to a large language model, a chatbot. So now you can ask it a bunch of questions and this thing will answer it on its own, right? And so the example that we used in the video is a banking avatar. Like as a teller, you can ask it questions and it will answer all on its own. We're not paying a person to do it. It's incredible. All right, so, uh, okay. I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit. Task automation. So, current systems versus legacy systems. Meaning you've got this new system of knowledge, all these LLMs, they've been trained on the world, the internet, right? But you have existing stuff, actions, websites where I click on things, apps where I clicky, clicky, clacky, clacky, right? Those things don't talk. Right now you can't ask an LLM to go book a flight. You can ask what's a good place to go, It'll tell you all about a vacation. It can make you set uh, recommendations. It can even give you itinerary, but you can't act on it. But if you go and take that information, redo it on Expedia, and then Expedia gives you a, a, an option, I can pick the options and then I can purchase it. Well, what we're doing right now is we're exploring ways to connect those two things. And the way that we're doing that is with tools that allow these LLMs to call third-party APIs. These are the actual interface, programming interfaces that websites use to access the actions within a website, right? And two examples of this is one, in ChatGPT right now, you can create using a plugin which is a piece of code that taps into an API, a specific chatbot that acts on that area of knowledge. Meaning I want to create a travel bot for Expedia. So now I can ask the GPT, which is chat GPT. So it knows about all the things about creating itineraries and stuff and it'll generate it. And then I say, now book the ticket and it will call the API via the plugin, enter all the information on the itinerary that it made up for you, and then send back an action that you can click and say book, right? But that is only in GPT. What about the rest of the world? Well, we've also got other things called assistance. And it takes that same type of functionality and makes it available in apps. So now, instead of creating a chat GPT specific solution, anybody, uh, travel, vol travel vol velocity or whatever they're called, can create their own chat bot outside of GP chat GPT in their app and just create a function, which is a coded version of the plugin to call their own API. Now, the crazy thing is the function in an assistant, the assistant is actually writing its own code to do that. Think about that for a second. You just gave it instructions of what you want it to do in your own app. Okay, I'll figure out the code that's needed to write that, to do that. I'll write it myself, and then I'll use that code whenever I think you, this is what you want. Okay, great. That's awesome. Okay, let's see if this video works. It does. 
but no sound. Um, well, I tried a couple of simple things, and then we're going to do some more. So I started with this. I understand that it can create 3D rotated animated GIFs and things like that. And really, in the background, what this is doing, the reason that it was originally called Code Interpreter, is that it is, in fact, writing code and executing that code in some kind of environment, some kind of a sandbox or something like that. So here, I gave it a picture of uh, the AdWord logo, and I asked it to make a 3D rotated animated GIF from this image. And it loaded the image, and as you can see, it actually will show you the Python that is running in here. And so it tells you each step of the way what's doing. It does this stuff. Uh, and you know, in general, it tries to convert this flat image to a base image with various techniques and things like that. And not all is necessarily smooth sailing. Uh, at the bottom here, it actually lost the GIF somehow. After all of this, it totally forgot what it was doing. So I gave it the GIF again, and it got back to it. It is kind of like having a conversation with a programmer in a very strange sort of way. And when I downloaded the actual animated GIF, well, I can't say it's quite what I was envisioning. I guess I was more envisioning it spinning around and, you know, around the center axis, but okay, it is a 3D rotated animated GIF, sort of, of the Azure logo, so fair enough. Now we get to the real- So this next example, as he's going through it, if you're a researcher, this is gonna blow your mind. This uh, charity event that I used to run. And uh, I have raw ticket sales from a number of different years of this. But the first thing I needed to do before I make a video like this is anonymize the data because uh, I didn't want to record a video with a whole bunch of people with like personal data in it. That's not really cool. So uh, I decided that I would use uh, this plugin itself to do that. And so let's take a look at what happened here. This was a fascinating thing. So the original spreadsheet. And you know that you should generally not use this uh, in chat to do it yourself because of the data privacy concerns and things like that. This is not Microsoft data. I admit. Uh, but nonetheless, I wanted to analyze it. And of course, I could have done this manually, but I thought, hey, this is a great chance to try advanced data. Components. And so uh, I loaded the spreadsheet in and I asked it to anonymize all the names and email addresses in the spreadsheet. So I went and did that. And it gave me uh, the first result. So it, it did it. And the first result it gave me was this, sheet one. Okay, but it only had one sheet. That's not what I was looking for. So I went back and I said, hey, this only has one sheet. Can you give me the three sheets? So I went back and it did it again. And this time, uh, it did do it. So it anonymized it. Uh, and it gave me the three sheets. But when I looked at it, I noticed that it had done something I didn't like. It was like, these, these two are actually the same user. This person bought two tickets. Uh, and it gave them two different names. That's not really what I wanted. I wanted it to be more consistent. And so again, I went back to uh, Data Analyzer, and I said that I said, "Hey, you know, the user email address is the same. This is all natural language. Then the generated name should be the same, also." And it went and finally did it in the consistently anonymized spreadsheet, which it helped. Consistently anonymized multi sheet data. So that was actually pretty nice because this totally worked. And if we look now at user 11, we see that they are both named Jeremy Chapman. Uh, not indeed the original name of this particular user, whoever that is. So now I have a nice anonymized data set and I am going to run some analysis on it. So this analysis is all being done by the model. Data set. And I'm going to ask you to find me the top buyers of tickets across all three years. So what we can see here is that it's running some Python, actually it's generating some Python that's about to run, to import this Excel sheet itself, as it did earlier when we were anonymizing. But this time it's actually going to interpret the data itself. And it has indeed discovered uh, that 
this corresponds to data from 2017 to 2019. And one complication of this is that I actually changed the ticketing system that I was using from Eventbrite to Universe between 2017 and 2018. And so it has correctly detected that the data is not structured quite the same. It's the same basic type of data. There's still people buying tickets for a charity event, but it looks a little different, and it's figured that out. Interestingly, we see that it had made some assumptions about the name of the sheet with the Eventbrite data in it that turned out not to be valid, and so it had to go back and make an event. It did all by itself. And it has correctly ascertained that in the Eventbrite data, there was a quantity column where if somebody bought multiple tickets, it would just show up as one row in Eventbrite. Whereas uh, in 2018 and 2019, when I used it actually made a row for each ticket that was purchased. So it's accounting. So it's correcting itself. And now we have the result. Stephen Kim was the top most purchaser. Now, I happen to know for a fact that Stephen Kim actually maps to me. If I was running the ticket system, I did indeed buy certain line tickets across these various years because as the administrator, Whenever somebody had a couple of tickets, I would buy it from my account on their behalf. So that's what the model is doing on itself. It wrote all those code on itself. It caught the mistakes inherent in the data set, refactored the code it was writing to deliver the on the original quest request. And that chart that you see there, that table. It drew it itself and formatted itself, right? So if you're a researcher and you have gobs and gobs of Excel sheet data, guess what you can do now? You can write a function to help parse that data and ask questions on that data, right? It'll save you a shit ton of time making pivot tables right and you can ask it questions to resolve or identify conflicts right that's the power of these things that's how it starts to apply to what you all do on a daily basis and what we do on a daily basis so when he should this is so this is a vp of my organization he did this on himself he showed it to the excel team <laughs> and the excel team says wow that's cool we should make that a feature they're making it a feature <laughs> so uh yeah um let's take all right so now we have this other thing called small language models so remember how i told you that these things these llms just suck power and they're expensive to run so one of the things that the industry is starting to look at is how do we make these things smaller how do we make them affordable to run how are we able to get them off the cloud and put them on a device, right? And so one of the things is these small language models. And um, these are basically models that have been trained on very specific data. And then what they do is they use that data source to train an LLM to produce synthetic data to create the new model with. So they, they grok data that's very specific. They feed the data to a big model to create a data set to make a small model. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, so what that, these things are, oh, what is grok? what's that? Grok. grok? Yeah. Compute, crunch, oh. you know, work hard at. Yeah. Is it a command line? Oh, no, no, it's not a command line. It's not programming language mm -hmm. or terminology. It's just a, I don't know where it comes from. Is anybody, you're a writer. What's it? <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Um, okay. All right. So what the, these models, what they're finding is, is that they actually outperform the large language models on what it was specifically trained to do. And that's human reasoning. So human reasoning, the example that they gave is, 
they're really good at math problems, right? They can solve complex math problems because they're trained on that type of data and they learned how to reason that type of information. They're also way cheaper to run because they're small. And they're small enough to now fit on your device so you're not paying for cloud compute, right? You're, you already own this, it's running on your device. But the downside is because they're so small, they don't have all the knowledge that the big models have. They also can't speak a million languages either. So there's a trade-off. So it's highly specialized and can reason really well, but you don't want to ask it any questions. So as you're designing, you want to kind of figure out what is the UX to let the user know what this model is good at versus say, don't ask me about that stuff. That's not me. Right? That's not what I'm here for. Right. That is going to be part of your design process moving forward as well. Accounting for the limitations and the capabilities of the model. Okay. So what's really interesting? You guys keeping an eye on CES this year? Rabbit one. Our Rabbit R1 just blew my mind. So this is a wearable device that is essentially an assistant that you can talk to to complete tasks. And it's called Rabbit because of it runs these errands. Go fetch it, go do this, right? That's how they came up with the concept name. It's essentially under the table. It's an assist. Oops. Sorry. It's an assistant that does functions, but it does it with not a traditional interface, but with conversational UX. You push a button, you talk to it, and it goes, does it. Right? And I love the quote in the upper left-hand corner. That's from the CEO of the company. That, my friends, is design in an AI world. It isn't about the technology associated. They could make this really hard to use, right? They could have forced you to say all these weird things and push all these buttons to get it to do this action. But they took the extra time to make it so simple that you already know how to use it when you pick it up. That is work. That is design, right? So what's new about this is they have created this thing called, and it's under there, a large action model, a LAM. And it's a new foundational model. So it's like at the size of LLM, but it's got a different uh, deep learning model associated with it. this neurosymbolic techniques. And I'm not even sure what the hell that means, but I got, you know, I'm getting up to speed on it. Um, but the gist of it is it's a learning by de demonstration approach. So it can learn to mimic or execute tasks by watching or ingesting information that tells it how to do it. Right. The crazy thing is, is that they also have a camera on this thing. And one of the new features that they're about to release, they've talked about it, so it's public knowledge, but they're going to release the camera to point at something and watch you do something and then learn how to do that on its own. Right. It learns how to use apps. So. Wait a second. You're telling me AI is going to be everywhere. It can see, hear, speak, write, draw pictures, create digital versions of me talking and moving, writes and executes its own code, and learns how to do stuff on its own all by itself. <laughs> right? So, it's all going to be okay. Really, it will be, right? And so these are the things that I think that you all need to understand of the changes coming forward, right? If you haven't done so already, go watch the movie Her. This is the future that is here today. 
This is more of what we're going to be doing, right? What's the first thing you notice about his desk? Right, there's no keyboard or mouse. What's on the desk? That's that little thing that he put in his pocket so that he can see. It's like a humane pin. That's how you're going to interact, right? AI is persistent. It can complete tasks. And it's completely multimodal, right? That is the future. And so what does that mean for us? Okay, so for those of you that have built a career on being the best Figma person ever, those skills are gonna get automated. What it means for all of us is that we don't have to be Figma experts anymore. I can just tap in any system and I can be an instant expert because it's all automated. I just tell it what I want. So that's going to free you up. Imagine all the hours that we spend making pixel stuff in Figma, right? Now you can do that like that, right? Now, with all that extra time, we're going to be asked to focus on the experience and the quality of the experience, right? And we're going to be asked to design the systems to bring that experience to life, not the pixels. Have you opened up Adobe Illustrator lately? <laughs> it's coming around the corner. Have you read uh, up on plugins in Figma? Mm -hmm. People are creating automated scripts to do all this shit, right? It's just a matter of time. Those scripts are actually teaching models how to do that. And then the model will learn how to do it on its own. You just ask it, right? What's the thing Illustrator? Uh, they've in incorporated the image generator into Illustrator, and now you can reason, draw pictures on top of it, and use images to draw more pictures. So, yeah. Um, but uh, whatever I've seen with like in the generation, uh, at least on uh, Dali, is that, for example, if you're trying to storyboard something. Uh, it doesn't fit to a, a character. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's that. People have already solved for that. Uh, Dali hasn't necessarily, or they haven't put that capability in. But you can manage that with the things that I talked to you about. So you can manage that with prompt engineering. You can manage that with the rag, um, and then you can give it a skill. You can give it um, a, ta a a function to be able to maintain that state. So. But I won't get into that. Um, anyway, okay, so um, I think I missed one here. Yeah. Okay. So underneath that, that says we will become, because now that skills are automated, everyone will be an army of one. You will have every skill you ever needed in your pocket, pretty much to do anything that anybody else anything you want to be. You want to be the best mechanic, you have the skills to be a mechanic. You want to be the best designer that can do print, websites, videos, you know, you now have the skills to do that. You are an army of one. The thing I talk, talk to some of my designer friends about who work at agencies is like, you essentially become an agency of one, you know? I can do the copywriting, I can do the production, I can do, you know, all the account management, I can do all these things. Right. But the, the, the thing that's really going to apply to us as designers is that this is going to give us the ability to explore concepts at a large scale. Right. So think of how much time it takes for you to bring a concept to life. And think of all the time you spend drawing those pictures and making that concept come to life that you couldn't spend making more concepts. Oh, I got a million ideas, but I only have time to execute five of them, right? Now you have the ability to execute all your ideas and you have now an engine to help you come up with even more ideas, right? So when we talk about superpowers, we have that superpower. 
but it comes with a cost because when everybody can curry crap, guess what you get? A bunch of crap. <laughs> Who's really good at making a decision about what's good or bad? Designers. And what's key to that is being able to think critically. So in the future, the ability to think critically is the currency that will set us apart because we will be the curators of what's good because we understand human interactions and what's going to be the best for our users because we understand users, right? And what's going to be really important is your ability to communicate that critical thinking to defend, rationalize, and sell through your concepts. Because guess what? The guy, Bill, who has really bad taste, who's the business guy, he can make pretty pictures now too. So are we gonna differentiate his idea, uh, his sh shitty idea from our good idea, right? They look good, they both look good. That's going to be the role of the designer. All right. And then our roles will continue to grow. So today we're moving into this curator mode, right? Things get automated and then we have a co-pilot. Now we're looking at, hey, we got all these great ideas. How do I put them together and make this thing and make it, you know, we're curating those concepts into a solution. Then we're going to start to move into a collaborator of experiences because we have all these things, systems are co-creating with us. So now that we have all these systems are now autonomous systems, we got to get them to work together. So we start to become experienced architects. But the next step after that is all these things become automated. And we're going to be generating the systems that sit on top of that automation. We actually start to become social engineers. That's the type of future all of us are going to be part of, whether or not we pursue a, a career in design or not. People are going to be at the heart of engineering our society. Why do you have automation at the social media? I think the automation that we have today are automations of things that we're already doing. In the future automation, the new things that we do will be automated. Right, we're, we're in a conversion stage. The next stage is auto generation or automated generation. Oh, um, yeah. Okay, so you can copy this. This is an article uh, that happened to talk about a lot of the things I just talked about. Um, and it goes in depth into additional things um really great article fairly quick read one of the best things about that article is the very last part it talks about dealing with the change to come and it gives some suggestions there i highly recommend you read and follow up on those suggestions so what skills will you need moving forward in my opinion Create expertise in critical thinking and design system thinking. And when I say design system thinking, the example that I've been giving is I, today I sat through some portfolio reviews. It wasn't a case today, but I sat through a lot of portfolio reviews with you all coming out of the HCD program at UW. One of the things I've noticed is y'all don't understand system design as much as I need you to and my, the people that I hire. But what I mean by that is, do you understand the rudimentary pattern that drives applications and how those patterns work and what underlies one application pattern from another? So for example, you're looking right at me. What's the pattern that underlies the email app? 
any email app. They're all the same. List. Yeah. Right? And then what happens when you click on that list? Just... Right. That pattern is called a master detail. It's one of the ways to describe it. Mm -hmm. You have a master list of entities. You click on an entity, it pops up a dedicated detail screen. The controls that you put on that are contextual to the type of content and the actions that you want to convey or uh, manipulate, have the user manipulate on the detail screen, right? You can change the content, you can send it, you can delete it, you know, those types of things, mm -hmm. right? If you look at any app, you can discern and break down the system, the pattern of those apps. That is the skill that we need. Because the building of that app, the extension of all the screens, of all the clicks on the back, guess what's going to be automated, <laughs> right? You need to be able to understand what the system is doing and what you're going to ask the system to do. Go ahead. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt you. Uh, yeah, so if you can hold off, there's going to be a QA. Um, Okay, so critical thinking, system thinking. You all need to get up to speed on machine learning fundamentals. Not to say that you're gonna be a machine learning scientist, God help you if you wanna do that. Um, but you have to understand how machine learning works. You have to understand the core concepts in there. Do you know what a, a neural network is? No? Do you understand how it works? No, you probably shouldn't. Because guess what the AI models and stuff that you're gonna be working with they're all based off of neural networks, right? So that's core understanding. The last one is, remember the data is oxygen. You got to understand the concepts underlying data science because everything is based off of that. And you're going to be tasked with understanding and applying experiences on top of the data science, right? So you'd be, you need to be able to understand those concepts. Okay. So what do I need to do today? I'm gonna to make this really quick and easy for you. First one, take an AI fundamentals class. Here's a great class at IBM. I've not taken this class. It comes highly recommended to me though. Um, do a search on other similar classes. ChatGPT is really good. ChatGPT or Bing search or Google Bard. Show me classes similar to generative AI with IBM. Just saying. <laughs> All right, get up to speed on machine learning fundamentals. I also have not taken this class, but this class comes highly recommended to me. It's from a guy named Andrew Eng, who is one of the lead data scientists working at, uh, or I think he's still there, at OpenAI. So he created things like these LLMs that we're all using today. He has a really great introductory course. Um, if you look up machine learning fundamental classes, like 101 level, I think is the search criteria or what I asked GPT, there is actually a class here, a free coursework class from University of Washington that was uh, very similar to this one, right? So that might be an option for you as well. Okay, next one. Learn about Conversational UX. This is a book, Conversational Design by Erica Hall. When I was working on Cortana, this is the book. This was my Bible at the time. It taught me all the fundamental parts of conversational design that I, would, I had to apply at my day job, right? It's still very relevant. What's different though, is the technology used to create conversations and what you're applying to conversations completely different now. It's all been done by these LLMs, but the concepts of designing for conversation still apply. Okay, the last one, everyone go build a bot. Get your hands wet, understand, fail, and then succeed. And if you guys are working on capstones, probably a good idea that you consider how AI might apply and try to design it into your capstone. 
All right, thank you all. Questions? All right. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm interested in understanding like kind of conversational glyphs and privacy. Um, imagine immediately thinking about oh, that's not going to place with a conversational glyphs. The biggest thing would be like, okay, a lot of things aren't necessarily like I wouldn't want everybody to know <laughs> what I'm doing, but they're just like, I don't know. That, that yeah. It, it's it's an issue. So I'll use rabbit as an example. The way that they get around that is they've they've uh, created um, an interaction pattern that's called push to talk, like a walkie walkie or walkie talkie, a walkie talkie. A walkie -talkie. So it only opens up when you uh, explicitly invoke it. And part of the user agreement is when you decide you want to use it, we have to listen. Right. And is it, are you okay with that? So they put it on the user to say, agree to the terms of usage. Without push to talk, the issue is well, is it always on? Is it always listening? Is it always collecting data? Right. Um, and do I agree to that? So what we'll find is companies will put that on the onus of the user. But the way they do it is like what Google does and say, hey, you want to Google an account? And they sign up and then they put all this legal jumbo and then it's this long scrolling thing. Nobody reads it. They just hit accept. Guess what you just accepted to? They have access to anything you do. I never hit accept. Or if I do, I do it on a specific account that I want that to be the currency and I shield the things that I don't want from with a different account, right? I'm very privacy sensitive. And I think y'all should be too. Your data is the currency for which you can establish relationships with these companies moving forward because everything that we talked about today is based off the data. It's on the users. Huh? It's on the users to be yes. aware of that. Yes. I love what they did in the UK or in Europe, where every website gives you a pop up and say, hey, this is the data we're collecting. It allows the user to modify what they can, you can and can't show. Right. In fact, I prefer now to use European based sites, even when I'm shopping. It might cost me a little bit more shipping, but I don't want them taking all my data. You've been having a lot. Go ahead. <laughs> I was having a conversation about this with a friend last night, and he's a marketer, so he's okay accepting everything. He's like, oh, I want all my experience to be personalized. And like, it still feels wrong to me, and I couldn't kind of like, it, I guess. That's so, the argument I have is it's kind of like, is the juice worth the squeeze? What value do I derive by giving them the data? If it's just the incremental kind of like, oh, they knew my name. Okay, I'm not going to give you my data for that. That's a transitory interaction. That's not personal personalization. If I get high value from that personalization, then I'm willing to consider trading my data for it. But if it's just anything that I would do regularly with a different coat of paint or a slightly optimized experience, I don't mind extra clicks if my data stays mine. What's the harm that? What's that? What's the harm that's giving you? What's the harm of giving my data out? What's the harm of The harm is in the instances I still get a bunch of spam. Right, I have no idea where they got my information. I and I'm really good at trying to maintain. At some point, I said yes to something. They sold my information to somebody who sold it to somebody else. I can't control any of that. Another thing I would never do, I, and I won't let my kids do this. They've been harping on me to do this because our family is mixed race. They want to do the 23 and me thing. Hell no. Mm -hmm. They just had a data breach. Do I want my DNA information? My personal, literally personal data 
available in the world that we have today with the nefarious governments doing God knows what, and maybe even us, depending on where elections go? Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm okay not knowing who my ninth generation ancestor is. Mm -hmm. right. so, any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the talk. So, I think it was very insightful. So, my question is around like one of the challenges uh, that you have mentioned that uh, these large language models use a lot of computational power, and one uh, solution around it, which you mentioned, was like using smaller language models, and your challenge would be really communicating the scope of those. So, I was wondering like, if you have a particular thoughts on the fact that when we are somebody, say, designing for LLM based projects, like, are there any UX frameworks or practices that one can think of to solve this problem of like computational power, maybe like designing for lesser research or things around that? Um. You really, the, this short answer is yes, there are. It's really contextual though. So it's hard to say like there is a, if we, believe me, if I could come up with a pill, you know, like the single ring to rule them all, I would retire, yeah. right? Everybody's trying to figure that out. So there isn't any one way. These are just techniques that are being developed to help mitigate it. So there are also, um, like an example is one way to mitigate it is to create a hybrid model where the model itself is a different size and you combine it with other models to take on cheaper, smaller models to, to take on specific automated tasks, right? Like say you, you're creating a solution where summarization is a key function but you also want to have general knowledge where you can ask it a bunch of other questions, it being the, the solution. You could run all of that with an LLM, but it's going to cost you. But if your function, if one of your primary functions is summarization, use the smaller model. You can run locally, won't hit the cloud. It'll do everything on the device. It'll never hit it. And then if they have on the rare instances or on the edge case where they have a larger question, that's when you tap the model, the bigger, right? So companies are looking at different ways to salute, to solve for that. It's like, hey, can I create a bunch of small models and have the big model just orchestrate that? Yeah. Do I, can I afford making all those models? I don't know yet. Are there models off the shelf that I can use? Maybe, probably. Right. So those are all the things that go into the architectural component of designing a solution that guess what? We have a part in that conversation. Um, I guess, sorry to sure. jump in here, but we're a little bit over time. So sure. um, what I can do is kind of wrap up the recording here and kind of log off the Zoom. But if you, you know, have time to say, if you want to do more like informal Q&A, people still have questions like you're welcome to, but and I also want to be respectful of your time just in case you have other, um, you know, obligations. Sure. But to everyone on Zoom, thank you so much for attending our workshop. Um, I hope that was as helpful to you as um, it was to me. I know I came a lot away with a lot of information and resources, so that was super awesome. And yeah, we'll wrap up the recording here, but thanks so much, James, for your time. Yep.